My name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association, and welcome to another edition of AFCA Roundtables. Today we are talking to the creatives and the talent from the new Peacock show documentary, Black Boys. For our roundtable today, we have Katia from Philadelphia, Reginald Pounder from Chicago, Al McGee from South Florida, Rhonda Rasha Penrise from Atlanta, KB in Houston, Janita Davis in Michigan City, see I got you, Ray Cornelius also in Atlanta, and Rebecca Ford in Chicago. I'm gonna sign off now, but I will see you guys when we close. Enjoy. Hi guys, I'm uh, Reggie Ponder, the real critic out of Chicago. Uh, I agree with Gil's uh, remarks in the beginning. I think they should have <laughs> actually been recorded. Uh, just the fact that you would look at African-American boys and men in a way that uh, told our plight is uh, very, very important. I, I will tell you is that I had PSTD uh, watching it uh, because it, it, there were just so many things that you guys hit on. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess the question that I'll ask is, what made you want to uh, pursue this particular issue um, yeah, what made you want to pursue this particular issue? Because uh, it's, it's, it's one that a lot of people don't want to talk about and it's kind of a, 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 touchy, a touchy subject, especially when you look at things like you did the mind and the body. Uh, what made you want to do that? Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, and I'll, I'd love to hear Greg's response after this too, because he's one of the few people who will speak very honestly <laughs> on this topic as well and, and had some of those early conversations with us. Um, but yeah, just a little bit of background. Um, the, the film was, um, we sort of conceptualized the film in the aftermath of my first film, which was about school segregation. So I had already been thinking, you know, pretty deeply about the racial injustices of this country, the inequalities in our school system, um, our caste system in a way that I see through our education system and, and um, you know, how that really shapes the opportunities um, or lack thereof of young people in this country. And so, you know, I was already really passionate about that. Um, the film was acquired by Ava DuVernay um, as sort of a companion piece to her film 13th. And so, you know, listening to her talk about this intersection of criminal and education, criminal justice and education really deeply, um, I was, I was thinking about that conversation, um, but then this was around 2017. It was the backdrop of sort of take a knee and the sports activism that was happening. And obviously we'd all been watching, you know, these horrific killings that were, that were going viral on social media. Um, you know, the death of black people and black men um, at the hands of police is nothing new, but it was definitely confronting us in a new way through social media. And I was just really thinking a lot about the reaction to that, both the brutality and the um, activism that was springing up against that. And I was wondering why there wasn't more outrage among white people, frankly, um, and the white people I knew who are, who are, who are liberal, <laughs> you know, good people, um, but why we weren't sort of taking to the streets and sort of toppling these systems in the way that definitely would have happened if it had been young white boys being killed. Um, so that's where I really started thinking about this idea of, of the humanity and wanting to create something through the lens of, of talking about humanity, because I do feel like there's a lot of stuff out there. And I come from an activism space. I come from a social justice space where we talk a lot about systems. We talk a lot about policies, but we don't talk a lot about human beings. Um, and the humanity that binds us together as human beings. Um, and so, you know, teaming up with Chad Williamson, who, who knows Greg and he'll, he'll speak to that connection. Um, you know, we really wanted to make something that we didn't really see out there, which was really about sort of the interior landscape of how it feels to walk through the world as a black man and a black boy. Um, and really illuminating the humanity, really illuminating the emotional landscape that we all have as human beings and how that connects us, whether it's pain or fear or love or empathy, this full spectrum. And really wanted to make something beautiful and, excuse me, like soft and, and loving and, and um, just, be, again, really beautiful, like not sort of the typical, you know, kind of um, piece that you would see around this, but really something that honors um, the beauty and the poetry and the, and the love that 
that exists there. So, um, but also unflinchingly looking at the truth and the reality and the, the you know, um, the injustice. And so that was where we kind of connected with Greg and wanting to talk to, um, you know, really wanted to bring forth this conversation about the body as the starting point um, and the commodification of black bodies in this country for white profit and really drawing that parallel from the beginning of this country to, to sports today. And I think that really plays out in all these other spaces, education, criminal justice, and, and it's all connected. So um, yeah, and then if you want Greg to answer kind of <laughs> how we got involved, but that was the entry point for, for us to approaching Greg. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, that would be good. Yeah, Greg, I'd love for you to jump in. Yeah, I, I think um, for me, the initial conversation again was just revolving around this idea, the idea of the black boy and if there's anything in this space, kind of what Sonia alluded to, is there anything in this space that really illuminates or highlights the humanity of the black boy, right? And then it, it asked more, you know, Chad and I had conversations about my time in the NFL and what does that look like in these conversations, the things that happen behind the scenes and what people say and treat you and how does it feel, et cetera, et cetera. And can you really articulate? And if we did articulate, if we did illuminate or illustrate it, what would it look like? What would it sound like? Is this too cheesy? Is this, how would you do this? Would you say this? Or how would you approach this? I mean, I think we had two or three conversations, our first few conversations regarding just the idea. I think we're both about two or three hours a piece. I think, I know for a fact, Chad and I had one that was about three hours, two and a half, three hours. And then we had another one. And then Sonia and I had a conversation for two or three hours. So, um, you know, for me, it's easy. It was easy just because of who I am. You know, I, I'm walking the walk, talking the talk. And so as you think about illuminating this opportunity to be truthful, transparent with people who only see some people, right, who only see me in the helmet and jersey, right, to really speak the truth and show that this superhero kind of figure that people have created has not always had the superhero mindset or invincibility. I think that um, that opportunity to be able to put that on display and show vulnerability twofold for the, for the people who, right, obviously want to look at you and say that you don't have any problems in this world. And then for the second, on the other side of that, for the young men and women of color who look at you and say, I can be him too. And that is good to feel like, you know, he, he's been where I've been, particularly those from, um, you know, um, low socioeconomic status or from areas that um, aren't as, uh, how do I say this politically correct, taken care of, you know? So um, that's kind of, that was my, my big jump to say yes. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for that humanity and thank you for the vulnerability. Really appreciate it. Hi everybody, Kathy Woods here, Couple Soul Show. One of the things I really liked about this film is how it showed you know, when our kids are little, they're cute. But something happens between like, and even in some cases, grade school to middle school, that same cute kid no longer gets looked at as a child and now becomes a threat. And when you think about it, you know, I think about my classmates in middle school, some have braces and were skinny and, you know, that's an awkward age. And I'm like, how did you become threatening? I love how people all of a sudden are programmed to believe that the kids are threatening. I'll talk a little bit about what the thought process behind that and why did you want to make sure to include that so people can see. One minute you say the kid is cute, next thing you're saying this is a criminal in the making. Yeah, I mean, again, the film is really trying to kind of get to the stories that have been told about Black boys and then sort of reimagining that, right? So one of the questions I asked of men and some young men, really from probably the age of 16 to 85, was when did you know you were a black boy? And that question always would sort of set, you know, whoever I was talking to back a little bit because you could just sort of see like the recollection. And Greg, you can talk about this because I did ask you this question, but you know, this, this like memory of, yeah, like going from a, just a child to a black boy. And that's very different in this country. Um, and that kind of going from that sort of innocence and freedom to suddenly you're being told like what black boy means. 
And that was something we really wanted to kind of get to because, you know, as Greg said, it's like often black men are really cast in very few roles in the sort of society. And lots of times they're superhuman if they're a sports hero or they're sort of villainous or subhuman. And there's very little kind of in between. And at least on, you know, on the media landscape, obviously in, in real life, there's a full spectrum, but in the media landscape. And so it was kind of that, what is that internalization that happens? So there's not only, you know, the, the, the yeah, the threat perception, but then what does that do? Like if you're a, a boy and you're growing up and you, you are suddenly looked at differently just for the color of your skin. You're suddenly, people are clenching or walking away or, or all of these things. How does it feel? Um, and we really wanted to kind of get to that. And so, you know, whereas the film is really, a, is really about being a black man, it's very intentionally about called black boys because inside every one of these men obviously is a boy. And there was that, that, that transition that sort of happened between and when they were told what it meant to be, to be black in America. Um, and so we really just wanted to kind of capture that. And, and, you know, by really starting with Greg, um, and Coven, his son, and bookending the film with them. You know, for me, I was thinking a lot about this two-year-old, you know, Coven on a second birthday. And, and that's really the point where kids start to hear what the world is telling them about who they are. Um, you know, they're kind of in this cognitive blob <laughs> up until that point. <laughs> and then suddenly they're hearing the messaging. Um, and so, as you see Greg, you know, he's rewiring his own son. He's rewiring our whole society and that messaging of you can be anything you want to be, you, you know, like that's what it's sort of symbolic of kind of what we need to do as a whole society. And so um, I was hoping that the audience was kind of left with that feeling of responsibility that it's every single one of us that's telling these boys what they can become and, and who they are. And, you know, while obviously we want boys to see this film and feel empowered to create their own narratives and define themselves and, you know, and figure out their own identities. There's a lot of messaging that comes from the world that's really, really messed up that we all need to take responsibility for. So, so that was kind of, you know, the intentionality behind that. I don't know if, Greg, you want to add anything? I, I think you hit most of it. Um, I mean, honestly, my biggest, um, one of my biggest challenges or purposes in this world um, that I feel called to do. Number one is to serve. But um, the, the second part of that is changing this narrative of me, right? Not me, Greg Scruggs, but me, the black man, right? I walk into a room, I got tattoos on my arms, and I was a former athlete. You've already created the picture of me. You formulated your opinion of who I am until you hear me open my mouth until you s interact with me, until you see the way that I move in a room full of executives in a room, and I move the same way right from that room to the room full of young black athletes. And then I move from that room to a room full of juvenile detention students, and then move from that room to a room of privileged students. So um, I spent this whole entire time un unknowingly retraining people what to think about black men. And so this opportunity to now go out and be a part of the film and show that not every dad is a deadbeat dad, right? Not every black father is, just despite the fact that they may be busy or have other things going on, um, is not this societal norm or this societal kind of creation or opinion that African-American fathers are uninvolved, right? Fighting this notion that athletes are unintelligent can't articulate, can't speak, right? Don't know how to um, formulate a thought or an opinion and put it into, um, you know, a package and put it out into the world. And so, again, for me, it's just re, I like the, the opportunity to nip at the bit at changing the narrative because every single time I have an opportunity or a chance to, I do, whether it's through the film <laughs> or if it's on a day-to-day -day basis, and walking in the building or walking past somebody who automatically assumes I'm not going to speak to them, who automatically assumes I'm not going to be the initiator of the conversation to say, hey, how are you? Smile and wave, not out of fear, just out of me trying to let you know that I'm not as I'm not to be as feared as the world may have led you to believe 
or as whatever, uh, you know, inadvertent, uh, inadvertent prejudice uh, you've come to believe about me. And so that was, this was a great opportunity to do so, to kind of highlight like this, this idea of being a, a threatening figure, but also showing the, huma the humanity to it, you know? And so whether I'm a part of the film or whether um, I am who I am, whether I'm on this camera, that's why I'm trying not to do all the talking. I want to let Sonya do all the talking. She's the mastermind of genius. I just had a story that she chose to highlight. There's plenty of me's, but I am who I am, whether this camera's on, whether that camera's on. Um, this was just a great opportunity to be able to speak to that and show people um, and give me a platform to continue to show people that, you know, we're not as threatening as one may lead you to believe. And that deep inside that helmet, that jersey, that musician, that dark skin, that tall body, those wide shoulders, right? Deep, deep down inside there, there's a heart, there's compassion. There's a young boy. Um, there's a boy somewhere who has dreams and aspirations. Sometimes they know of them and sometimes they don't. And they're just looking for it. Um, and we're just hoping that you don't discount us or push us off to the side because of the way that we look. And this was a great chance to be able to, you know, take another step in dispelling that kind of idea or that ideology about black boys and black men. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Ray Cornelius from Upfront Inside Atlanta's Entertainment Industry. Um, Sonia and Greg, this is a really, really good uh, film. It actually took me a while to watch because there were moments when I stopped and had to reflect and, and thought about my own journey. And, um, you know, so it, it took some time to, to see the film, but there were two things I wanted to ask uh, for you, Sonia. Are there going to be any, um, I guess, grassroots or community efforts in trying to get this out beyond Peacock? Like, I, I felt that this was a, um, a film that the students need to see. Are, is there an opportunity to get this in to the schools uh, for the, the black boys to see. And then for you, Greg, there was a line uh, where a gentleman said, um, if dead or in jail is all there is, we have failed miserably. And that really hit home. Um, and so just wanting to know, what are some other ways that we can show black success outside of sports and uh, entertainment? I feel guilty because I'm, I'm a reporter. I, I, I've been in entertainment for the last 20 years. But how can we change that perception of Black success not just being in um, film and entertainment? And Sonia, if you can start first, and Greg, if you can answer that, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, we have the vision. <laughs> we had the vision for this film being kind of foundational for hopefully a lot of other, you know, efforts, other films. Um, the idea being that yeah we have to disrupt and actually flood the media landscape with stories of success um and hopefully this can kind of help inspire that and we're working on that um in terms of grassroots effort educational efforts yeah absolutely i mean i we want it to be in every single school we think every single teacher should see this um and so we're working on that um in terms of distribution educational distribution stuff like that um but then there's also um you know the, one of the co-producers chad williamson as we've mentioned a couple times he's really sort of the social impact you know leader on this and has developed a learning management system for educators so we should if you want to sort of talk more about that, um, it is, it's a really, it's kind of an interactive way of breaking down the film and, and looking at the different components because it's like you said, there's a lot in there. It's very densely packed, but each of those things are like threads you can pull on. And one of the things, you know, that's really important um, is this idea of windows and mirrors that surfaced, right? That Sharif al talks about and thinking about our classrooms as really these, um, these eight hour, however many hour a day places where, where boys and girls are internalizing messages, whether you're white, black, or, you know, any other race or ethnicity in this country. Um, and as said in the film, a lot of these education systems are sort of built on white supremacist or, you know, white privileged kind of curriculum. And so, um, even breaking that down in terms of, you know, what are the posters on the walls in your classroom? What are, you know, who's the teacher that's standing in front of you in the classroom? What are the literature that you're reading? So, you know, working with Sharif Al-Maki, working with these, these 
voices in the film and trust, you know, the Center for Black Male um, Educators, XQ Institute, these really these leaders in the space, like they're really working closely with us to try to get this into the schools. Um, because this is another thing is, is, um, is, 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 uh, is it, I'm sorry, is it Katia? Katia, is that how you say her name? Yeah. <laughs> as, you know, I thought a lot about this idea that we have a very, very white female teaching core in this country. And there are a lot of, I, I believe, really well-intentioned white female teachers who are standing in classrooms that want to help black boys, um, but haven't honestly reflected on their own biases and very unconscious often. And so um, I think that's something that really needs to be brought out through this film too, is, is you know, is, is the white, is particularly white people's fears, but particularly white female's fear, because they're often the ones standing in front of classrooms of, of black boys maybe sending them to the principal's office, you know, more, or, you know, not knowing why there's a little bit more fear there than they would have with their white stu male students who might be exhibiting the same behavior, but it doesn't feel the same way to, to a white female teacher. So, um, you know, the, the classrooms are the f sort of front lines, we call it front lines of justice for the learning manual. It is the front lines of, of, of this movement. So that was a really long winded way of saying like, <laughs> yes, it's definitely we want to be <laughs> in the education space and we can talk more about that or we can point you to that. Um, I'll, I'll, I can go on about that. So I'll stop. Greg, your turn. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, in regards to your question about how we can show success, I think you hit it right in the right in the core of the question, right? I think it's all imagery, right? What do we show our young black boys? What, what do they see? How do they see it? You know, um, I work in athletics and I work, I was in the administration first. And so as the director of player development, I never talked about my, I never talked about athletics. I never talked about my athletic career to the young men and women that I served here at the university. I never talked about my playing days. I never, they, most of these kids have never seen my Super Bowl rings. I don't, brag on that. But what I did talk about, I talked about how I graduated college early. I talked about how I worked in business first. I worked in sports marketing prior to taking the job here. I talked about going to grad school to get my MBA. I talked and I showed them, I tried to introduce them into different careers and curriculums. And so, you know, there's a student that says he wants to be in um, real estate. Okay. I didn't tell him that he needed to build capital um, through the NFL to be able to get in real estate. I, I immediately set up a meeting with a realtor for him to understand all the ins and outs of real estate and that it's not just tearing down a house and building up a house so he can see the image, so he can understand and hear the language of what it takes to be a realtor and not just see what he sees on TV. I take a bunch of money and I flip it. And ironically enough, I had that realtor say, yeah, you need to make X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z dollars playing football and then we could do that. And I quickly paid the tab for the coffee and we left and we found <laughs> another realtor to introduce him to, right? So I think the number one way that we do it is by solely by imagery. That's why I tell my son every day, what do you, I ask him every time I can talk to him, what do you want to be? If he says, I want to be a firefighter. I always throw out some type of opposing uh, career because I want him thinking on both sides of his brain. He wants to be a firefighter. Cool. You ever thought about being a police officer? Yeah, and then the next day he'll say, I want a police officer. I'll say, that's cool. You ever thought about being a, uh, how about, a, you know, it would be cool. It'd be cool if you were a scientist. Yeah, you build cool things. You blow it up. You like that? Like, yeah, and then the next day he'll be a scientist, and I'll flip it on. Hey, man, you ever thought about being an astronaut? Don't you want to, oh, how about a pilot, right? And so I constantly throw out these things to him to where the image that he sees in his eyes when he sees himself as successful are all these different ideas and not dad. He doesn't care what I do. He knows that dad played football and that's it. When they see football players, those just like what daddy did, not what Coven wants to do, which is me again, rewiring, rewiring and retraining. And I think the second part after imagery is truth. <laughs> the way that we begin to demonstrate to young black men and women uh, in this world and young people in general, the one thing that we have to be able to do with them is show them and tell them truth. What I, 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 the one thing I do not miss more about are the guys who are in this building and the young, not the young women, because I'm not too 
well versed in women's athletics and sports that's particularly at the professional level but i am well versed in uh professional athletics from you know the male male sport perspective um i i don't mince words when i tell them hey listen look around okay maybe one of y'all gonna make it two years in here okay so everything that i instill in you as a player as a person these are the things that we talk about that will take you through life that will help you in life i had a kid who was late to something earlier this week I brought him right in here at 6 a.m. Breakfast Club. Uh, it was a Saturday. Yeah, Saturday. I brought him in at 6 a.m. on Saturday and sat him down. The reason that I did, and I didn't run him to death at practice. One, that'll get you in a lot of trouble now. But two, it was more important for me, for him to see what he did and how that was going to affect him, not in football. I could run him every day if I wanted to. But son, you got to understand, you're a young African-American kid, right? You don't get the, you don't get the leash. I don't care what anybody told you. You don't get the leash. So sit down right here while I still have a hold of it, and I'm going to help you and educate you as to what you need to do to be different so that you can be successful in this world. Kids need to see that truth, not listen. If you don't do that, you won't make it to the NFL. Bump that. I was blessed to be 6'4", 285 pounds that can run a 4'6". That you, you're not, okay? Most of the world isn't. OK, so now what do you have to do to be able to be successful? So I think, number one, we have to show them the imagery of it. And I had an interesting it was it was completely inadvertent um, uh, uh, kind of case study and imagery earlier today that I hope to get to. If not, I'm going to tell you all about it anyway. But I hope to get to but an interesting case study and imagery and what it does to the mind subconsciously, which only reaffirmed my belief in what we have to show the young men and women of color. But two, the truth that we have to tell them that realistically, we're not killing dreams if we tell you the truth. We are. Right. We're just telling the truth. The two can coexist, the truth and your dream. <laughs> OK. All right. They can coexist in the same space. All right. But I don't think that. Um, you put all your eggs in either one of the baskets, right? You kind of live life and go on, proceed as it is. And I think the more that we can get kids to believe that and understand that from respected individuals, going back to Sonia's point, from respected individuals that they believe, that they trust, I think then we begin to change the narrative. I'm just fortunate enough that I get 120 of them every day, 110 or 115 of them every day that I get to do it. And Ray, honestly, is something as simple as I run every morning on the treadmill. Every single morning I run on the treadmill or I do some type, I work out. But if I'm on the treadmill and the kids are walking in the workouts, every single kid I call by name and I tell them good morning because it's a life skill I don't want them to ever lose or forget walking into a building or a room, particularly the young kids, right, and the kids of color, the life skill that they need to develop of walking into a room and seeing somebody such as myself, I'm not too cool to say good morning. I'm not too cool to walk in and command a room solely off of politeness and respect and give you and make you or demand the respect out of you that I deserve because I can't hope that you give it to me. And maybe that's a lived experience. But for me, I know if I walk past you and say good morning, if you don't say good morning or at least acknowledge me back, this is more about you than me and I'm okay. And I'm okay. And I think continuing to show the young kids little things like that I was going to be able to change that narrative. So again, that's a long-winded answer, Ray, and I'm sorry, but it's two things, imagery and truth, I think are the two things that we need to do to begin to change this outside of entertainment, right? Outside of entertainment and sports, show them imagery and tell them truths. And I think we can begin to um, change what it means to be successful in this world. Thank you, guys. Hello, this is Al McGee with YETicket.com. First, my first question is to you, Greg. Uh, and I'm t this is, I'm going to build up to that question. Uh, I, I myself, I grew up in Chicago on the south side of Chicago. And when I was growing up, my parents and neighbors and friends get your high school education and get a job. Did that, but then I realized I didn't have to limit myself. I became a college professor at an HBCU, and I have two master's degrees, and I was a school teacher. But when I watched this documentary, it looks like these young men limit themselves that they only have certain things that they can achieve, sports, the entertainment business, 
and maybe a business, maybe, but that seems to be it. So when did that change for young black men that they're very limited on their future uh, when they become adults? And Sonia, my question to you is this, as you were talking to these three uh, young black mothers, they were crying, they're fearful. Do, what's the difference between their fear and white mothers' fear? Do you see the difference in that? And why is, I, I kind of know a little bit why there's a difference, but do you see that? The difference between a white mother and a black mother? Greg, you can go first. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. You know, my, my, my opinion, um, again, not a, not a truth, but my opinion on when this thing changed or when this, you know, when it became limited for young black boys um, is when, you know, if, if it's for this generation, it's when media became uh, easily accessible and available to everyone. And right, and I'm not the oldest uh, person in the world, but even I, and it just shows the way things have, you know, the way kind of media and access to these things have changed over the course of time. But as a child, I had access to the local stations, 5, 12, 19, 5, 9, 12, 19, maybe channel 64, maybe channel 48. Those are the only channels I had on my television. If it weren't something on there, go outside and play, right? Go outside, go be active, go do something. Until fifth grade, sixth grade, I didn't watch TV. I only liked to read books. That was my number one objective. And so what I'm seeing now, particularly in my experience, my lived experience, is the access to only these particular pigeonhole, you know, kind of um, – uh, sectors, right? Entertainment, right? You're good. You know, we want to compare everything that every young black athlete does to go into whatever professional realm they want to be in. You want to go be in professional sports in order to play in professional sports, in order to be blank, in order to be this athlete, in order to be that blank, blank, blank. And so now the mind subconsciously is being trained to only think about making everything I'm doing relative to that particular sport right, or that particular industry, be it in, be it entertainment or whatever. And so I think the more that we get away from that and the more that we get away from the, um, the image, again, going back to this idea of imagery that's portrayed to young men and women of color, I think the more that we get towards people no longer setting boundaries or limits. Much like yourself, I was raised the same way. Go to high school, get a high school uh, diploma, go get a job. You know, and I allude to it several times, go work at the McDonald's up the street, go be a, a construction worker or be a city worker. Those are my three dream jobs. I knew the, I knew the guy, the manager at the McDonald's up the street. They posted it, they, they how much money they made. It was on a white little eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper on the door. I saw it one day and said, boom, game, set, match. I'm gonna graduate high school. I'm gonna work right here. That'll be good. I found out how much the construction and the city work made. Same song and dance. And so I think, um, you know, once I began to meet other people and I began to see that there were levels of success and there were other ideas of success outside of just those three, it opened up my eyes. And so it goes back to what I was saying to Ray is that how do we go show this image and how do we begin to get this imagery into young people, right? And I think it's people such as yourself who I wrote, I mean, I wrote down here right now, right? Uh, HBCU, two degrees. Okay, how do, I, how do I now say I was on the phone call, I was, on the, I was in a conversation with a gentleman who had uh, two master's degrees, was an educator at an HBCU, right? Yeah, but let me tell you this too, that I did get my dream job. So I lived in Chicago. I did work at the steel mills. And I did work for uh, General Motors car company too. Mm -hmm. Those were dream, dream jobs back then. Right. But I realized this was not for me. Right. And I think that's, that's, and I think that's what's most important is that for somebody who, somebody who has the opportunity to take the dream job, have to quit looking at the other job as the dream job. So, you know, again, in my position, leaving the National Football League office right. where when there was a position that opened, there were literally 624 applications within 24 hours for this one position. 624 applications for this one position that I came second to, that I, and I came second in line to. That I wasn't the position that I still have my, my current role there, but that I came second in line to. And so 
staying there for the, the demand of that position, some people would say that's the dream job. But for me, the opportunity to come here as the director of player development and be able to serve young men, right, and serve these young men and women athletics department and changing the narrative for black men, sure, now this becomes my quote unquote dream job. And so the more that we can get this image out to them that quit chasing the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and understand that there are so many other things that you can do with your life in this world, whatever it may be, if it is a trade job, if it is a factory job, if it is some other type of field that you're, you know, that, that somebody else would downplay or, or kind of cast aside, man, you, you, you know, disregard them, take it. And I think the more that we can speak to young men and show them, um, you know, that there aren't limits or boundaries, and the more they hear from people like me who says, listen, I grew up, people such as yourself, who say, listen, I grew up with this limit, with this boundary, and I'm telling you that it's a, fa it's a falsehood. It's a fallacy, all right? Yeah. Sure, your role might be a little tougher, but at the end of the day, right, because you overcame the hurdles and the bumps in the road or whatever the case may be, you'll find out that success is a little bit more sweet to you, whatever that looks like. And so I personally believe the more, when we started to show or started to push young men young men of color to certain kind of areas and when they had access now even now more so than when i was younger to these kind of images of what success looks like right chains and big houses but don't see the work behind it um, i think that's when it began to shift for them saying well i can either be here or i can be here and nothing in between forgetting that the space of the, 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 the opportunity in between um, really is, is uh, I'm limitless. Sorry. Thank I you very much. I'll keep no, that's okay. That was great. I want to add, yeah, a couple things without getting into like a PhD dissertation of this, but um, because the film didn't really, you know, hyper analyze this. I'm going to get to your other question in a second, but I think this is important. Um, you know, because we really wanted to talk about the emotional landscape more. So we didn't go too much into sort of the analyzing the historical and the systemic stuff. But from what I've seen, um, what I've observed, what I've heard from a lot of people is that there was really a big shift because I think if you take the sports world, right, like it, it was originally um, football and, and sports, and I'm not a sports person. So like caveat here that I'm not going to speak very thoroughly on this, but it was it was segregated in the beginning, a lot of the sports, right? And so when they started to be desegregated and they started to realize that they were gonna win more games with more black players on their team, uh -huh. that sort of, this is a crude way of saying it, but that kind of farming of black boys and black bodies really started to happen, especially in the South where they really did, you know, go into these schools and they tell, you know, black boys, this is how you get a college education, or this is how you get a scholarship. So they provide all these incentives to these boys to try to go the sports track, because especially if they're low income, they know they're not going to pay for education in other ways. Um, and like Greg said, you know, he just wanted his mom to not have to pay for college, like a single mom. And there's a, so there's a lot of economic factors. Again, I'm, I'm going to just kind of raffle through this. Um, you know, I think in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there was a lot more push towards Black professionalism. There was affirmative action. There was all these things that were kind of happening. Um, and that really started to reverse in the 90s because of our school system. Our school system has gotten hyper-segregated, you know, highly unequal. You, you know, if you look at the stats on what schools of color, with students of color get, and, the, and they're getting more and more segregated, and they're getting more and more unequal, so you're putting less resources into these schools, preparing students less and less for college. Um, you know, conf conflating with that is is the the hyper kind of marketing of sports that happened in the '80s and the '90s and Nike and you know where you suddenly are being inundated right. with this imagery of success being through your body. And so, and then there's the war on drugs and there was you know the whole super predator thing. I mean, there's so many things that kind of conflated where it really, I think, did reverse a lot of the progress. I mean, we've, obviously, we never, ever came far enough in this country, but I think there was starting to be a little bit more. And early in the making of Black Boys, I spoke to a man who was like, I would say, in his late 70s, early 80s, 
born under segregation, born under Jim Crow, and like I think Tennessee, you know, um, fought in the civil rights movement. It has spent his whole life fighting for racial justice, and is now in his 80s. And that's and that's the first thing he said to me is he said, you know, we took it for granted that that what we fought for those gains we're going to be kind of inherited that the that, that black boys coming after us, we're going to be able to build upon the gains that we fought for. And that didn't happen. And as a result, he said, we lost two or three generations of black men. And now we're fighting for the babies being born. And that was really like haunting. I mean, there was a lot of policies or a lot of things that happened in the 80s, 90s, 2000s that really deliberately right. tried to reverse the gains of the civil rights movement and really tried to push this you know, messaging on black boys, you know, use your body, go in sports, play for us, entertain us. This is how you get, you know, success and belonging in this country. Anyways, I can go into that. So to answer your other question about moms, you know, I can't speak totally authoritatively because I'm not a mom. I have friends who are moms. Um, but I think it's very different. I mean, I, I think every parent, of course, fears for their child, has fears, worries about their child, of course. But I don't think white moms, I mean, white moms don't think their boys are gonna get killed by police officers. They don't worry about their sons being pulled over by police. And I think if you have a white son in this country, you know the system was built for him. You know, he can bend it and break it. And, <laughs> and you know, um, it yeah. works for him. It was built for white men. And so there's that kind of inherent sense of insulation, even though there's obviously that primal fear of any child, this little being is in your you know, hands, of course you love and you want to protect this little being. But I think especially as white men grow, I see my friends who have white boys and white teenagers. I mean, they're definitely not up at night worrying about what happens if he gets pulled over by a police officer. So it's very different, the burden that black parents have to carry is is far heavier from what I've observed and it's unfair and it's devastating so um but again I don't have children so I can't speak to it. that's just I'm just talking to a lot of people and I feel like there is a big difference well thank you very much you did a great job with that it's a great film to watch and also I'm glad you have Alan Page on there he's always been my favorite because he mm -hmm. became a judge after football thank yeah. you Thank you. <laughs> well, that kind of leads into, I mean, why do we stigmatize sports for Black people when, if you really know the history of it, sports has been at the forefront of civil rights. And you have people, one of the reasons I got excited of seeing like a Chris Carter or seeing Carmelo is to show that they are doing more than you think. I know for a fact Chris Carter and his brother own a security firm. I know like there are all kinds of businesses they're like Brian, Brian Gumbel went to Bates College on a baseball scholarship. The problem is people only show athletes on the field, but they don't show where you go afterwards. As a football player, you're only going to play, well, most people play two to three years. The people that extend it out are lucky. So I don't understand why we don't put the focus on what the systemic challenges are, because if a white guy goes out and he plays sports, it's a great thing and it's a springboard for other businesses after playing ball. Why isn't it the same on the other side? Well, I think it is. And I think Greg's a great example of that. You know, we show Greg's story and he's somebody who had a, a whole other life after and every, you know, um, Carmel, all, all these men. But unfortunately they are really often the exception. I mean, there's a lot of black boys um, that A, don't ever make it into the pro in the first place. So they maybe put their hopes in that or their you know aspirations in that and then they don't make it and they don't have a backup plan. Um, there's a lot of the statistics on how many NFL players go broke within three years. I think it's like 80%. So you have these young boys that are suddenly, and Greg, you can talk about this, you talked about this, is, is you're suddenly you're getting paid a lot of money <laughs> and like it's really like everybody wants a piece of that and suddenly you're really responsible and and a lot of you know 18 year old 19 year old 21 year olds like it's hard to know how to invest money or what what to do with that and how to prepare for the long term and i think some of the, the programs and again i don't watch sports i don't know but i think from what i've heard some of the programs are 
trying to create more financial literacy and 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 talk about education more and i think that's maybe shifting but i think statistically you know there is there is kind of a lot more of that you know you you make it you don't make it or you make it you get paid for a couple of years maybe you get an injury and then you're out and suddenly you're back in your small hometown with no, you know no no backup plan so it's not to stigmatize sports at all you know harry edwards always talks about that we put that quote with you know you dream with your eyes open it's not to stigmatize sports or to dissuade people from doing sports but it's like you said to dream with your eyes open it's to know the reality of it to know that it can be a springboard, but it can also not be if you get, God forbid, you get an injury and you don't have a backup plan. And then you, you know, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways. It's just, it's to broaden the conversation. It's just to say that there's, there's much more beyond sports and not to pigeonhole black boys in that, um, but not to stigmatize it. I mean, yes, it actually, it has, as you said, been a springboard. Um, just dream with your eyes open is the message, you know, and yeah, Greg, Greg can speak a lot more on that because he works with these, <laughs> these young athletes every day. Yeah, I think, um, I think, you know, me being able to speak candidly about it, having been in that position, uh, the truth of the, the truth of it is that more times than not, we don't have a lot of people who fall into that success story category, right? And my former brothers in the NFL, why do I know that? Because my former position at the league office was ha not handling, but overseeing our former player space. So I worked with Chris and his brother um, and knowing the businesses that they had, um, the portfolio businesses that they had um, and people like that. I think what we have to take into account again, when we think about the stories and the success stories are the ones that we see right and so it obviously and most of the ones that we see are people who have who are truly the exception to the rule right the successful businessmen um that we don't see it goes back to my point of not stigmatizing it but figuring out a way to get those people highlighted which once we figure out that the solution to that problem or the answer to that question i think we begin to change it so when i say the exception to the rule chris carter being a hall of famer uh, is the exception to the rule because a Hall of Fame will always get the platform. However, I could talk to you about Brig Owens, who also played 13 years, who's a successful attorney out of Washington, D.C., um, who was a first-round pick, really, really high-touted athlete, et cetera, et cetera, but got done playing, has been an attorney for 40 years, uh, 30 years, right? And But how do we highlight Brig Owens? But the problem is not the sports part of it. Mm -hmm. The problem is in the education system. So like you can't be successful, like if you have not been prepared educationally, but whenever we hear this, we are always attacking the sports part of it and ignoring what the root problem is. You, you, should, you should have an opportunity to live out your dreams too. But like if you, if you never learn how to work with money, if you're a fireman, you'll still be broke. If you are construction work, you'll still be broke. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. I just think that the reason that sports get attacked is because up until recently, um, and, and even more so now, um, sports are education. They are a part of the educational system. Coming from somebody who was behind those walls, there is an obligation and a duty for a franchise of any sort who is paying a young man, 20, you know, a 20 year old kid a few hundred thousand dollars a year in other cases you know a few million dollars a year there is some type of obligation for you to protect your investment right young people you can make the argument are the investment contributed to this world by whomever you want to say they are and it is an obligation by our city our our, our country um to protect those investment by education there's no different than in the sports world we get to a franchise if that franchise is not doing everything in their power to protect their investment whether i'm the last man on the roster or i'm the highest played player here then they are failing us as well and i think more times than not what we've seen is that franchises particularly sports franchises only care about the return on the investment they get from the merchandise sales what they get from the uh, advertisement sales or marketing and media sales, but they don't really care about the return on investment they're getting from changing the life of the young man outside of his financial realm. And I think that's where sports now begin to get the stick.
stigma is because you get chewed up and spit out. And if you don't, if you work out, you work out, we'll protect you as long as you keep giving us something back in return. And if you don't end up being worth anything to the franchise that value, well, good riddance. There's another 21 year old, fresh body, able body kid that will take less than you who will walk right in this door, you know, and, um, and, and, and do, and do your job. So I think that's where, the stigma with sports becomes an issue because you don't hear the argument for eighth grade sports. You don't hear them saying, uh, I don't, at least I don't, I can't say you, I don't hear the argument for youth sports. Don't, don't let them participate in youth sports because they're not educated. Never hear it. I don't hear about high school sports. Collegiately, you start to hear it a little bit. And then for sure, once you get to the professional realm, you start to hear about the lack of education, the way that athletes are chewed up and spit out. And having been on the other side of that, I can attest to the fact that athletes are chewed up and spit out. And there are some organizations who do it really well, do their job and commitment really well to the athlete. Then there are other organizations who don't do such a good job. And I think you, if the messaging is only coming from the negative and you don't hear about the positive, like I have not, I have not a negative word to say about the Seattle Seahawks organization. They did everything in their power to try to educate me, to prepare me for life, to try to make sure I had always, always played the game with one foot out the door. Right. And that was by the personnel they had involved who educated me. Now, can I say that about other organizations? I haven't played or worked for all 32, so I can't. But I have played, I have talked to people who will come and say, no, it's not like this everywhere else. You just show up, do your job. That dude's just collecting the guy responsible for your success outside of him. He's just collecting a check. And I think that's where the stigma comes in, mainly for professional sports. If I, that's, my. Well, thank you for your answer. But what you also described, I mean, they do it in corporate America, too. No doubt. So I'm no. just saying that it's deeper than just sports. No doubt. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hi, uh, it is KB here. Thank you so much for chatting and, and thank you for this documentary. Um, so, you know, the documentary also puts a spotlight on education as well and the clear changes that need to be made overall. Uh, but particularly within our educational system in order for our Black boys to feel more protected, encouraged, and, and so on. Um, you guys even use a quote that, um, you know, basically says having a Black teacher significantly reduces the chances of Black boys from dropping out. So this question is actually for Greg. Um, I'll, I'll shift it a little bit. Um, what educators had a profound impact on the healing of your preconceived notions um, that were placed on you by society and really encouraged you to be the best version of yourself? Um, I think of, I think of two, one, two, um, I think of two in particular that stick out to me. Uh, Mr. Spears, my sixth grade teacher, um, and then uh, Mr. Balloon, uh, my sophomore math teacher, who I actually just highlighted um, on my Facebook feed a couple of days ago. Um, those two had a real impact. Mr. Spears, because that was, I won't say it was not that everybody didn't believe in me before, but that was the first time I felt belief that I was smart enough that I could do better, that, that you know, I had an opportunity and a chance to be better. Um, you know, he was a, and ironically enough, he was not a person of color. He was a white man. And, you know, here I am talking to him um, about, my success and things that I can do when I get done and my opportunities. And again, I didn't look like I look now. So being an athlete was never in my future. You know, I just wanted to graduate high school. So uh, Mr. Spears being one of them, just because that was the first time I felt real and true belief um, was from him, despite the fact that it was only in sixth grade. And I, I can't pinpoint one situation where I said that was my aha moment, but he's clearly always stuck out to me because of his belief. And then my second one, um, Mr. Balloon was because as I reflect on it, and I guess you could say Mr. Wilkins as well, um, my faith and sacraments teacher at, at my high school, but they were teachers who challenged me. And I used to think that they were out to get me. I, I took it deep to heart that they were out to freaking come at my soul for school because here I am this inner city kid at this really prestigious high school and they're just trying to get after me. And I, and I, did, I didn't like it. Upon further reflection, as I began to get older, I realized how much they were trying to challenge me to prepare me for what was to come. And they weren't going to let up on me or make me a charity case, which I was so used to the world trying to do for people from my neighborhood. And so I am 
appreciate them for not treating me like the charity case that I didn't grow up in parochial schooling, that I went to public schooling up until eighth grade and then all of a sudden getting into the toughest school in Ohio, by my opinion, um, but getting into the toughest school in Ohio, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I appreciated that, you know, because once I got to college, I realized how hard they pushed me and how much they were preparing me. So those three men really stick out. Um, you know, I think the one thing I do have to note is that I don't remember, you know, I had one teacher of color that I can remember. I miss Roberson, my English teacher, but one that really stuck out um, was when I was in sixth grade and she wanted nothing to do with any of us. And when I mean us, I mean black kids. And that really was bothersome. The only thing she wanted something to do with was the other black teacher because they ended up dating or something like that. But, and so that really kind of, stuck out to me, you know, um, because there's your real image. There's your, that for me, that was my imagery and that's who I wanted to see and, you know, be, and they really didn't have anything to do with it. So those three, those three really stuck out to me um, and changing my experience, if you will. Mr. Spears, Mr. Balloon, Mr. Wilkins for sure. And I don't want to leave anybody out, but, you know, hopefully they don't watch this and get offended. But those three stuck out for sure. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hi, it's Jonita Davis here. Um, I, have, I have two questions. One for Sonia. Um, how did you, in the very beginning, decide to approach this topic from the sports-centric angle? Uh, we've seen this topic at, uh, of black boys and, you know, um, and, and, and just all the statistics and, and just the reality of it approached in a couple of different ways. But this is like one of the first times I've seen it with mm -hmm. where sports is kind of central to the argument of, well, not to the argument, but to the, 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 the whole conversation. Um, you, you kept coming back to it and in a very, I mean, it was very um, refreshing way. I just wondered how you got there in the beginning and for Greg, um, I have a senior, a 17-year-old senior, um, and he's running around with friends who have these sports dreams. Um, he, fortunately, he's a nerd who wants to be a writer in history. You know, do history run when he gets old, when he grows up. Um, but what would you say to a mother who's looking at her boy who's about to graduate high school? He still wants to be a ball player, and she can't get him to, you know turn she's frustrated can't get him to turn another way those conversations over and over and over again so i just wonder what you would say to that mom and sonia again how did you how did you come to sports as your way into this conversation well i love that he's a nerd but <laughs> like history that's amazing um the sports thing again is really related to the the humanity piece and also opportunity i mean i was very struck by the number of young black men I met while making my first film, Teach Us All, and talking to them and just again hearing, you know, I'm gonna be a sports player, I'm gonna be a football player. I'm gonna, like, I was, it was really, um, I was surprised that it was still sort of so dominant. And um, what really struck me was a, was a young guy from Little Rock who said, like, in my neighborhood, you can be four things you can be a sports player, a dope dealer, or be dead or incarcerated. And that was really like haunting to me. Um, so I was first thinking about sports through the lens of opportunity and just everything that we've talked about in terms of the um, um, the opportunities and the very limited opportunities often presented to young black boys. Um, but like I said at the beginning, I, I also, again, not ever watching sports myself. <laughs> I was watching the sports, my dog's having a little bit over there. I was watching the sports activism and I was asking myself, why are people so angry at like Colin Kaepernick or these other people that are, that are speaking out? I didn't understand why there was so much backlash against that. And it got me thinking about why they're trying to silence their voices. Why don't you want to hear what they have to say? And 
that was really the question is, is do you just like, again, not being someone who watched sports as I'm like, so white people, you like, you clap and you cheer when they're playing for you and they're just in a helmet or whatever, but then you don't want to hear what they have to say when they're talking about the things that they care about. Um, so, you know, it's really connected to that, the full humanity and the voice um, that's often silenced. Um, I think it's very connected to um, you know, I wanted to really talk about humanity. And so the body piece in this country is very intimately connected to sports. And like I said, that's a continuation of the body um, argument that, or the body that's been from slavery. I mean, it's a, it's a continuation. As, and I was, I was maybe seeing that because I don't watch sports. So I don't sort of, um, I guess I just, I was able to see it a little more objectively or, or whatever, see it from a different angle. Um, but I think it was really important to start that conversation around the body, talking about sports and then trying to grow it from there. Um, so that's why. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, as, as I was listening to her, I was trying to find, um, uh, I was trying to find a statistic. I actually went to a mental health summit, NCAA mental health summit, um, prior to switching roles to being going into coaching here. Um, it was a very, it was a three day summit. So, so solely is super selective for 250, 300 um, trainers, physicians, uh, licensed uh, counselors, etc. cetera. Um, and to KB, I believe is her name, KB. I think she might've signed off. Okay. Um, but to her, Greg, you put yourself on mute, friend. I'm oh, yourself, am I, am I good? Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good now. Okay, thank okay. you. All right. All right. I was on mute the whole time? Repeat what you said, please, because we missed, like, a, a vital portion. If you could, please. Uh, oh, yeah. So, I think, um, you know, I was, I was, as I was flipping through this, I went to that mental health summit um, uh, back in January, and one of the, it was just speaking to, again, going back to what I said to Ray, um, this idea of imagery, um, and I'll get to your question um, there, Janita, but this idea of imagery and what it takes for African-American men and young men uh, to be able to do to be successful. And one statistic that stuck out, again, not in the educational field, but one statistic that stuck out was that they found um, that uh, when an African-American man, African-American man, or at this, this case, it was for student athletes, student an athlete had a African-American uh, physician or surgeon or somebody in medicine, the compliance rate was 80% with whatever the suggestion recommendation or whatever the case may be. When they had an African-American had a white or Asian um, physician, licensed counselor, or somebody in the medical field, the compliance rate then dropped to 30%. Right, and so I thought it was imperative again, going back to this idea of imagery. If and that's just one field, right? That's obviously again not education, that's not whatever. But if I had to take a guess, I would assume that the same type of statistic and the same type of truth applies across different fields. So that was just to the point of education there and African American men. And what I would say to your son. Um, or what I would say to that mother, whether it be you or my own mother or anybody else, a friend of mine, the first thing I would say to them is, do they have a chance? If they have a chance in sports, let, let them ride it out. Continue to let them ride it out because there are a lot of things that I learned in sports that I haven't learned anywhere else, okay? The discipline that it takes um, to be uh, good at it, um, this idea of being a teammate, um, this, this kind of mental toughness that's built up in you, right? The adversity that you face, the different cultures and peoples and background that you have to meet. There are a lot of things to learn through sport that I would never, ever give up because once it's over, it's over. You know, it's not the same when you're in the intramural, I mean, when you're in the, uh, the, the men's softball league or the Monday night golf league, because all you're doing is trying to get a break from reality. You're not learning anything anymore. And I think, as long as a kid is in this phase, this learning phase, let them ride it out if they have a chance. The second part of that then is never kill a dream, but always tell the truth. And, and again, like I said earlier, the two can coexist. Okay? I, I deal with it every day with kids who solely who came to college to go to the NFL. That's the only reason that they thought sports, that they thought they were going to get out of sports 
was the NFL. And it is my job to not allow them to walk into this world blindly thinking that all 110 guys get an opportunity to play in the NFL. NFL has been around for 100 years. There have only been 22,000 players, 25,000 players. People can do the math. So don't look at me as the bad guy. And that same thing I would tell mom, you're not the bad guy. I'm not the bad guy. I didn't create these statistics. I didn't pull them out of the air. I didn't, I, I, I'm not. This is the truth. Whether you choose to pursue that truth, whether you choose to pursue that dream in the, in the midst or light of that truth, hey, it's completely up to you and I'm supportive of everything that you do. And if it doesn't work out, um, if, if it doesn't work out for you, then I tell you what, hey, at least you had the information, you tried it. If, I won't say you failed, but it didn't work out. You weren't successful at it and that's okay. That is absolutely okay because I did not come in here, in my opinion, that's what I would say that, mom, you didn't come in here to try to save them from every failure, but to only be here to help them learn the lesson from it. And so if that is what is deemed failure, that they don't make it, you didn't necessarily set them up for failure. You gave them the truth, which is all life is going to be. All you can do as a parent, all I can do as a parent is prepare you for the world. Now, what you go do with the information I give you is up to you. And that's really up to you. So I would say, you know, never kill a dream, but always tell the truth to that young man that, that hey, listen, here, here, here's reality, here's statistics. And I can only say that because I have to do it every day with people who think they have the talent. Somewhere along the way, they were told that you have the talent to go play on Sunday. Somewhere along the way, they were told that you are talented enough, that you have everything in you, right, to go play on the NFL. They were told you will play in the NFL one day. That's cool. And I'm not here to kill that dream. And God knows I'm going to do everything in my power to help you achieve that. But what's most important is that I also tell you the truth. Okay. And the truth is, again, there were only 25,000 players that played in the National Football League, right? When I was still working at the National Football League, there were only 22,000 at the time. Okay. Only 7,000 played more than three years. 7,000 out of those 22 played more than three years. And then if you keep going down the line, right, only... 5,000 or 4,000 or something like that played more than uh, six years. And then it was something like 2,000 or 3,000 played more than 10 years. And so the statistics, and there's 7 billion people in the world, right? And you can keep going down the line, right? I shy away from the average statistic because I was a part of a team that was doing a study. There were so many moving variables that, that said that, 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 that played into that right, was, you know, because we don't create a loophole or caveat for injury. So if a guy only plays two years because of catastrophic injury, he gets thrown into the equation as well. So I stay away from the averages, but I'll tell you, here's what the truth is, okay? All right, 100 years, 25,000 players. If you think that you're one of the special ones to be able to go do it, son, go do it. If it doesn't work out, I can't blame you for trying because I didn't bring you into this world to shelter you. I, was brought, I raised you in this world to hopefully prepare you for whatever may come at you. And however you react or whatever you do with it, that's what you do with it. And so every single day is a fight for me, for these young men and some of the women on campus um, to do so. And that's the information I would share with you and your son. Chase your dream, son. Chase it. Here's the truth. Okay? Here's the truth. But chase your dream and I'll support you. And when it's all said and done, you'll look back over your shoulder and uh, I'll be here. And I must say, I'm that way because my mother was that way. And she did not care what I did. All she knew is that she was going to tell me the truth about whatever it was. And whatever I was going to do, I was going to work hard and I was going to be humble. Those only two things that mattered to my mother. And so I try to share and instill those same things in young people. And I would encourage you, not to say that you don't, but that's my encouragement to you, right? Is to always um, check, allow them to go do whatever they want, stay encouraged, back them, because now I love my mother more than ever. I mean, I, I've always loved her, right, since my father passed away. But I look back on it, and you come in contact with some parents who aren't supportive of their children's decision, and it severely traumatizes a kid from going out and really achieving their full potential in life because they always feel like they don't know if they're making the right decision. Virtues going, making that decision with the information that you give them, realizing that it might not work or actually falling flat on their face, but getting up and actually turning into something and really reaching their potential because they weren't scared to reach and they weren't scared to dream. So always never kill a dream, but always tell the truth. Thank you so much for that, that, that positive spin. I've never heard it t told that way. I'm clipping this and <laughs> in, in showing it to moms, I promise you. Thank you.
And thank you, Sonia, for your, your background too. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Ford. I'm based in Chicago, and I think I'm the, the, the last one in, in line here. I have the same question for both of you, um, but I realize that you're, you're on separate paths and you'll have different answers, so I'll do it one at a time. And Sonia, actually, you touched on this a little bit in responding to Ray. Um, before getting on this call, I was just on a call where uh, Kobe Bryant's Dear Basketball was used as a teaching tool for seniors in high school. And so I wanted to ask you, Greg, well, so what's next? Or, you know, this, this is film number one. Are you going to build on this um, and add uh, uh, film and entertainment as one of the arrows in your quiver? All right. And, and then, uh, Sonia, then what's what's next for you? But Greg, what's what's happening? Um, I walk by faith, not by sight, and I mean that in every sense of that phrase and statement. And so, um, I couldn't have told you two years ago that I would be here. As a matter of fact, if you would have asked me in December thirty first, two thousand nineteen, if I would ever be a football coach, I would have told you you're out of your mind. That there's no chance I would ever, ever, ever touch being a coach, I don't like it, couldn't stand it, and yet here I am sitting in my office preparing my young man for a football game this weekend. To, re to be completely honest with you, I think um, this was an opportunity. I, I only saw this as an opportunity to tell a story. I mean, Chad is a friend of mine, um, and then meeting Sonia and just really having a conversation with him. Um, it was, I, I'm, you know, it was easy for me. I'm not an out front type person as much as my personality may seem as such. Rebecca, I'm the, I am the, I should say Mrs. Ford, my apology. I am the um, epitome of an introverted extrovert. So if there is a chance for me to hide in the closet or hide behind a, a, a wall, I will. But if there is also a chance for me to speak, share my story, uh, to motivate, to get in front of people, um, I'm from a family full of pastors and preachers, so um, and which means there are also a bunch of first ladies, uh, a bunch of um, revivals, uh, Sunday night revivals, Tuesday revivals, a bunch of vacation Bible schools. Um, so I, I've always been, uh, I've always had to be able to use uh, the gift of gab, if you will, to um, to articulate my thoughts. So if something were to come and somebody ran it past me, and it, it seemed like it was for the right reason and purpose, I'll never chase a dollar. Never, never will I ever, I'll never chase a dollar. But if it was for purpose, I, I, I never looked at Sonia and said, hey, Sonia, I'll do this for you, but what do I get paid? Or how do I get paid? Or if the, as it's begin to gain traction, not one time have I looked at Chad or Sonia and said, well, how much will I don't, I, to be completely honest with you, I don't care. All I care about is the message that we portrayed in the film. And if there were parts, I remember reaching out to Chad, Rebecca, there was one part that came in and Chad said, how do you feel about this? And I said, as long as our film, and I say our just solely because I was a part of it, as long as our film doesn't lose its authenticity, I don't really care. But I'm just worried about the authenticity of what we were really trying to convey. So I'll never chase a dollar. I don't really, I won't say I don't really care about entertainment because truthfully, I almost took a job as a morning radio show host. <laughs> oh, but I, I just, it was because I felt led and compelled there. And so if the opportunity ever presented itself, it would, but what's next for me, um, that lies in the hands of the creator, the creator who I believe in, um, who sits above me um, and, I'll go where he calls me next to lead and serve. And if that's in film or entertainment and industry, you daggone right, I'll go right in March, right into that industry and I'll serve those people the same way I've served every other industry or every, under, every other sector that I've ever been in or every other room that I've worked in. I've done nothing more and I've committed nothing more in this world than to being a servant to the people that I'm around. And sometimes I fall short of that, I'm okay with that. But if it's an entertainment and industry, sign me up. But I, I, you know, I, I, I go where I'm called to, and and then that's that's about the best answer I got for you. <laughs> well, Greg, th thanks so much. Well, Sonia, um, I'm sure you're interested in entertainment. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm also a little bit, I'm a sort of an accidental filmmaker as well. Definitely came from, you know, the social justice space, education space. Um, I just saw the, the power of the medium to really, um, I guess, hopefully influence people and, and change their hearts. I mean, um, but I come from sort of a policy background and seeing the limits of that um, and seeing how it's, again, you can talk about systems, you can talk about policies, you can talk about this stuff, but things don't really seem to move until you reach people emotionally. And um, so, yeah, I mean, these two films that I've done so far, two feature films, and I've done a short film have been sort of just me learning this. I had no experience and I had no training or mentorship. So it was kind of just learning what this is like and I love it. Um, but I don't know that I have a, I'm not sure what's next. I think probably for me, this idea of deconditioning and disrupting narratives is really important um, because I think we're all like sold a lot of lies about who we are and um, women as well. And so my background is also in women's rights and gender stuff. And so I think that's kind of calling to me again is, you know, what are the lies that women have been told about themselves, about, about who we are and how do we decondition that and how do we reclaim our narratives um, as women um, and we're seeing this kind of come to a head right now too so probably something in the the women's rights space um, and then also yeah I've I haven't tried a narrative yet but I'd love to um, and so maybe I'll teach myself that next like a narrative uh, film so we'll see but I wish I had a, a better more concrete answer for you <laughs> well that's fine all right well thank you thank you so much Thank you so much. Thanks for all your questions. It was wonderful yeah. speaking with you all. If if I uh, if if I, I said I was going to do this, I wanted to make sure I do it particularly because of um, this. It literally was an aha moment, um, and I've shared this with a couple people today. It's it's just in the space of imagery and what we talked about. And so I was on a Bible study earlier today, and they asked us to draw a picture. Um, that the idea was about this image of God, whomever you may believe in or whatever God you may believe in or whatever um, idol you may worship. It, it, it is, it, it was, it said, draw a picture, draw an image of Nippert Stadium. Nippert Stadium is where I work, okay? And so I'll show you, I'll show you this image. And it just speaks to this idea and the power of imagery and why I believe that is something that we have to do and commit to in order to be, um, uh, you know, in order to be able to change the narrative. So here's the picture I drew, okay? And, I, and I'm saying this to, um, to you all. You do whatever you feel with this information. I hope that it, it empowers you to think more about your imagery. I shared it with my young man earlier today about them looking at the people around them and do they see, if you don't see the success that you see that you want to have and the people around you, then subconsciously you're feeding yourself every day the wrong information and consciously it will surface and manifest itself some way, shape or form. So here's the picture that I drew. Okay, don't mind it. Okay, this is the picture that I drew. Yeah, it's, we only have four minutes. Okay, we only have four minutes. So this is the stadium over here. Okay, these are the seats. These are some more seats. These are some lights. This is the field right here. Okay, this was this. When he asked about the picture of a stadium of UC, that I didn't think twice about it. I just, I said, you know, this is what it is. Now this is a full stadium, whatever, what have you. And then after we got off the call, I'm like, why would I draw a picture of the stadium like that, right? There's these the real profound pictures of Nippert Stadium, which is right behind my office right here, or like these down shots or night shots where you see the whole horseshoe and really illuminate, look really well. And then I turned around, I looked out my office and this is the view from my office, okay, of the stadium, all right? And I only see one side, I only ever see one side, and I only see the field right here, and there's the press box and the lights. And again, I didn't think or look before I drew this. I just drew it. But subconsciously every day, I look and gaze out this window, and that's the image that I see. So when you ask me now to regurgitate that image and put it on the paper, I give you what I subconsciously have fed myself every day. So when I talk about imagery and the importance of it, that was just kind of, like I said, the inadvertent case study in it. I think it's important for all of us, whatever that we're doing, whether it be with young men, young black boys, or whatever um, field or sector you may be in, 
um, to make sure that when we're looking out into the world that we're subconsciously feeding ourselves with the things that we want to see, the things that we want to be, the things that we want to hear, the things that we want to be a part of, the things that we want to be, um, or the things that we want to shape. Um, because if, you, if you're going out and you don't see it, um, or whatever you're surrounding yourself with every day, that imagery now is subconsciously implanting in your brain um, and, and now either maybe limiting you or will help you unlock your full potential or whatever it is that you want to do. So, sorry, I had to take that moment because I've been waiting to share that with somebody. I've been holding that in my head all day. Like, I got to share this with somebody. I got to tell somebody about this aha moment I had about imagery and the way that it really works subconsciously. So thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you all. Thank you so much, though. Thank you. I appreciate thank you. you and uh, both you and Sonia and, and Chad. Again, wonderful uh, piece of work. Uh, we are looking forward to part two and part three. We've got to keep on telling the story. We've got to <laughs> see that young man, your, your young son, grow into a man. Yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Um, yeah. thanks a lot and you know uh, you can always count on us to support what you're doing and so yeah. you know just keep us in mind when you're uh, you know when you're putting your projects out I appreciate that thank you so much we appreciate all your thoughtful questions and yeah, thank you all yeah, we appreciate, appreciate it. It. absolutely <laughs> good to meet you all good. Yeah. absolutely good night everybody <laughs>